Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all are having a good start of the week. Definitely feels like a Monday for me, so bear with me if I'm a little bit more scatterbrained than usual. I know that doesn't seem like that could be possible, but you know, bear with me on that one. Um, quiz 10 is due. This is normal time, normal day. Uh, make sure you're just keeping up with it. Again, two of them are dropped at the end, so if you have a bad couple of quizzes, it's not the end of the world, but if you miss them, obviously those will count against your drop quizzes, so there's something to keep in mind. Um, don't forget that your extra credit is due next Friday when the um, exam comes up. So it'll be due just like last time at 11.59 that day. So even if you come in here and bomb the shit out of the test, just go do the extra credit. It'll at least be worth five points or, or five percentage points, right? Um, and also don't forget that next Monday is the final day for the uh, Connecting with Biology 2 assignment. Uh, for those of you that have been primarily watching at home, um, if you have some specific reason why you cannot be on campus and doing that specific trail or one of those trails, let me know. I'm happy to try to provide proper accommodations for those sorts of situations. Um, but for the rest of y'all, I do expect that you go out and walk. It doesn't have to be a long one. There's plenty of sh short and small trails out there. And for context, there is a trail that even though it's not on the like UCF Arboretum proper, it's a little like boardwalk trail that goes um, right next to like the, the trailer building for the Arboretum and all that stuff. That's fine too. So, um, any quick questions regarding any of that? So I'm going to print like 100 copies of the test next week. Um, so we will have, or sorry, like 200 copies rather. Um, so if you would like to take the test in person, um, shoot me an email or just tell me in class. I'm just trying to keep a rough idea of the numbers. Last time we had about 20 or 30 people that didn't let me know. And so as a result, we had a couple of extra tests that were missing. Um, and it took a lot longer. And I'd really like to try to avoid that. But for the most part, it's available online if you'd like to take it. If you had issues with um, the software and all that kind of fun stuff, just take it in person. It'll be easier. I know it's not as ideal, but it's really not that hard of a test, I promise. This one will be a lot easier than the last one, just because it's a lot more concept heavy. Um, along those lines, don't forget we have a review next Monday. Um, if we bleed over on time, which is a very good chance that we will from these next two lectures, we'll put some of that stuff at the beginning and cover that first. And if I have to, I can bump the review to Wednesday and kind of cut some of my citizen science and talking about why we did all that bullshit with our naturalists out. So I think it's cool to be able to talk about that stuff, but I still want to highlight that. Yeah. So that has been a process. Um, so I got a hold of SAS. They told me they delivered it to College of Sciences. I stopped by there this morning. College of Sciences supposedly had it picked up by somebody from biology, but it's not in any of my mailboxes. So I'm gonna have to go harass biology department and see what, what the hell's going on. I promise I'm tracking it down. It's taken me longer than it should, but um, for context, like the SAS, I already had it in my mailbox in biology by like 10 days ago now. So it's kind of ridiculous that it hasn't shown up yet. So. I'll give biology department a hard time and make sure I track it down. So don't stress about it too much. Oh, one thing I did want to bring up, but it's, I don't think it really affects too many of y'all in here because if you're in here in person attending lecture, you're probably doing a lot better than most of the others that aren't. Um, but um, something to keep in mind, drop ad is Friday. So if you are concerned about your grades at any point, honestly, if you have lower than a C in this class, you probably should consider dropping. Um, but it's not the end of the world dropping the, the worst thing that's ever going to happen to you, but do what's best for you and your GPA. Don't worry about me. All right. That being said, anybody else have any sort of extra comments or anything? Cool. Um, great. So let's go ahead and get started with our last kind of like talking about evolution and uh, genetics and all that kind of fun stuff. Today, we're going to be talking about speciation and extinction. So how do new species derive from each other? And then what happens when they go extinct? And they, they lose something. So, first thing we need to identify if we're talking about creating and losing species, we need to define simply what a species is, right? So, in evolution, a new species forms while others become extinct all the time. However, we have to define species as close as we possibly can. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of gray area to this, and it's an active issue with science. Um, but ultimately, we define species as distinct groups 
of organisms um, that don't really, that can change somewhat over time, but are kind of compartmentalized as much as we can into this is A and this is B. So as we've been talking about, evolution can, produces all this diversity, right? So you have these small evolutionary changes that accumulate over time in a population. This is called microevolution. And these occur quickly, can occur quickly, but they can also take a long time to manifest as well. Just kind of depends. Eventually, though, this leads to what we call macroevolution, which is the slower, more gradual process that results in large scale changes. Well, Linnaeus uh, was the first to actually classify species based off of their appearance. So this happened in the 1700s, and, and arguably this is the first scientific approach to this. There are obviously people that were saying this is a dog and this is a cat. But um, in the 1700s, Carolus Linnaeus created the naming scheme for species. He came up with this very basic concept, which includes a name that combines both a broader classification, which we call a genus, with a term called the species or the specific epithet. So for instance, with humans, we are homo sapiens. Homo referring to man as like a colloquial, or as a collective term, not as you know, gender thing. Um, and then sapiens as is wise. That's usually where that's derived from. Now, biological species concept is primarily the way that we typically group um, all these different organisms into specific categories. And it's based off of reproduction. In other words, in the biological species concept, you define a species based off of their ability to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. However, there's a lot of gray area in this, and it's not really a very solid, reliable strategy to exclusively focus on. For instance, I think I gave the example last week of the lion and the tiger, right? A lion and tiger can breed together and have viable offspring that can then reproduce themselves. Yes, that's still a hybrid. It's not, it's not a single species reproducing. And a lot of that is just based off of genetics, ecological life history, and a bunch of other different things that we also take into account beyond just the basic can they reproduce together. And like I said, some species just can't simply be defined by reproduction in general. So asexually reproducing species or species represented only by fossils can never interbreed, right? Because they're all dead. So how are we going to be able to determine if this is a species separate from something else? And as a result, some of these organisms could have the potential to interbreed, but they don't do so in nature. For instance, if there's some sort of or physiological barrier, like a mountain range or an ocean, and all of a sudden humans move them from one place to another, that barrier is gone, even though they're still, they should have been still isolated as separate species and that now can interbreed. Additionally, reproductive isolation is not always absolute, especially in plants. Plants get just kind of really funky and have a lot of weird things going on with their genetics as a result. Now, probably the best way that we really have nowadays to do this is through DNA genet or genetic analysis. So our researchers can often compare the nucleotide sequences of a specific gene or a group of genes together um, within a specific organism to basically classify you fit more into group A or more into group B. And there's a lot of statistical metrics that you can apply to this, things called like F stat and a bunch of others that basically say, based off of the differentiation between these groupings, A is more closely related to A or B is more closely related to B. So if the DNA of two organisms is typically more than 97% identical, they're usually considered the same species. However, like everything in biology, hard and fast rules don't really work very well. So expect that that probably differentiates a bit slower. And what some scientists agree with, others may not. And so it does get complicated very quickly. Um, especially in snakes, there is a knockout, drag out fight right now for the rat snakes. For whatever reason, there's three or four species that supposedly occur in the eastern part of the US. So from Maine down to Florida and over to about the Mississippi River on the western side. Now what's happened is, is over time, a lot of these have, have been hypothesized and agreed with each other. They have very different, strongly distinct color morphs, but the color morphs don't matter. They're just kind of part of the thing. So are these really one distinct species that just have a couple of different color morphs, or are they three distinct species based off of locality or color morph itself? And it gets really complicated and it's caused literal <clears throat> fights at scientific meetings where people have like gotten into arguments and like yelled at each other for two hours and it resulted in a push-up contest at the end. It was really entertaining. 
but it's stupid as hell. <laughs> so even genetics isn't a perfect way to do this. As we kind of mentioned last time, um, it all kind of depends on your methodology and how robust you can make it. So if you're only looking at mitochondrial DNA, that again, only comes from the mother, right? That's not gonna be super helpful when you're talking about the overall diversity of everything, right? Because you're missing about half of that diversity that's coming from the, the male parent. However, you don't wanna account for too much genetic diversity. You shouldn't just look at the entire genome and say one slight difference in a base pair is different enough to call something a species. Because obviously there's genetic differences between individuals of the same species. Humans have different colored hair, different colored skin, different colored eyes, all these different things, but we don't call each other different species, right? That's stupid. Um, and so as a result, you have to be very precise in what you define as a species from a genetic perspective, from a morphological perspective, which is where you're like measuring the length of particular limbs and that sort of thing, as well as that reproductive method that we talked about earlier. So just a quick review question here. The biological species concept could be applied potentially to which of these four organisms? Humans, plants, extinct organisms, or organisms that uh, look alike. Which of these cannot be classified using that biological species concept? See, right? Because we can't test if they're going to be able to interbreed because they're all dead. Kind of defeats the purpose. So yes, the answer is in this case, C, extinct organisms. Now, ultimately, what kind of stems at the, the, the reason for all of this diversity, right? And why um, you would classify a species as a separate species is that there's some sort of barrier to reproduction that causes species to diverge. At some point, there's some sort of mountain range or artificial selection or something like that that's saying this population is now population A, which becomes its own species, and this is population B, which becomes its own species. And these lines may not always be very readily apparent. For instance, there's some, oftentimes, especially in the case of the last, I don't know, 10 million years that where mountain ranges are, where rivers are, all of that kind of stuff has shifted enough that it makes it kind of difficult to discern, okay, this is a species that broke off 15 million years ago from its closely related relative. Even, if, even though there's no barrier there now, that's changed a lot since then. This is especially problematic when you're talking about the US. Um, and in Europe, it's a little bit different because there's a long, long history of civilization there. But because uh, the, the way civilization has been shaped on this continent is very different depending on the different time period you're talking about um, and how the people that lived on this continent managing the land in different ways has changed so dramatically. It makes it really difficult to say what was connected and what wasn't less than even 400 years ago here. So just that difference is such a stark one. So what are these different types of reproductive barriers? Well, pretty straightforward. You can either have these barriers that occur before the formation of a zygote or after. So in other words, something that's stopping those individuals from reproducing, or maybe there's something wrong with the sperm and the egg and they can't bind together. Or then you get postzygotic, which just causes that animal to stop function. Um, so in those prezygotic reproductive barriers, we talk about things like habitat isolation. So in other words, they just don't live in the same places. Temporal isolation, they don't uh, they come out at the same exact times. The great example of this is something like the 15 year versus the 17 year cicada. They literally are just off kilter a little bit. They just don't come out at different times. And it's the only reason why they're different species. You have behavioral isolation. Maybe for whatever reason, there's some sort of reproductive behavior that's causing those changes. Uh, as well as mechanical isolation, so reproductive organs, that sort of thing. Obviously, a chihuahua and a great bean are going to have a very hard time trying to reproduce. Very similar kinds of things happen here. And finally, gametic isolation. There's, there's something weird about those gametes that can't come together. And then you get to those postzygotic uh, reproductive barriers, which includes things like hybrid, hybrid and viability which basically means that hybrid adult fails to develop properly and will die before it can reproduce. You have hybrid infertility, which is where that hybrid adult can't reproduce. This is a, a great example of this is mules, which is a combination of a horse and a uh, donkey. 
And as a result, that animal cannot reproduce at all. And then finally, the hybrid breakdown, which is the offspring of the hybrid adult have re reduced fertility. This is usually where that tiger and lion example typically falls in, where, yeah, they can reproduce, but a liger or a tigon is going to have very, just not good and healthy offspring. And as a result, over a couple of generations, they kind of die out. And we, we, we can't go full Joe Exotic here and try to bring back saber tooth cats by just randomly mashing together lions and tigers. They're going to die out on their own if you try to do that. And again, here's some more classic examples of some of these different things. So for habitat isolation, for this is especially influential in a lot of insect species that hyper-focus on one specific species of plant. If one insect species, even though they look exactly the same, will only live on one plant and the other one will only live on another, they can't reproduce, right? They don't occupy that same period of time, that same niche in time. Again, that temporal isolation. Field crickets do the very similar kinds of things where they just reproduce at different times, and as a result, they separate into two different species. For behavior isolation, this one's particularly interesting because for frog calls, <clears throat> you can have two organisms that look exactly alike, the pig frog and the bullfrog, for instance, which are both about that big, both have dark green skin, have a lot of spotting on them, but their calls are totally different, and as a result, there's that reproductive isolation. Uh, for mechanical isolation, there's oftentimes, for instance, um, situations where specific plants will have different styles of flower and that sort of thing. And as a result, they can't easily pollinate between the two. And finally, that gametic isolation, where things like sea urchins aren't going to have gametes that are compatible with each other, even though they look exactly the same and have very similar niches. And then coming back to these post zygotic ones. You can have situations where that hybrid offspring is just not going to generate, and that you usually see that in hybrid eucalyptus seed. They argue that lion and tiger crosses is infertile. That's not technically true. Ligers can reproduce, but it's, it's a mess. And then finally, there's um, that hybrid breakdown, which is more akin to what we were talking about with that liger example. So another quick review question here. Which of these following is an example of post-zygotic reproductive behavior, barrier? A cross between a horse and a donkey, two different types of fireflies that lure mates using different flash patterns, bees that pollinate one uh, plant versus hummingbirds that pollinate another, and finally pine sperm that can't fertilize spruce eggs. I'll we'll just kind of talk through these. For your post-zygotic. Post, right? For your post-zygotic. Pretty. What kind of it is, is it? What kind of barrier is it? Behavioral. behavioral, right? What about this one? C, bees pollinate one and uh, hummingbirds pollinate the other. It's pretty zygotic, right? So behavioral as well. And finally, D, which one is that? Is it pre zygotic or post zygotic? Free. And what kind is it? Fertilization, right? So it's pretty straightforward in this case. That would just be that the horse and the donkey produce an infertile mule. Again, it's the same example I used. Now, spatial patterns in particular can often define two different types of speciation. So reproductive barriers can arise from physical or non-physical separation and depend on the geographical setting. So for instance, here with allopatric speciation, you have two species that are, have no contact between the two populations because of this giant mountain range that came up. So at some point, this mountain range to uh, split this two population in half, and maybe they both had yellow flowers and both had purple flowers, who knows? And for whatever reason, this population over here changed to a different color because maybe there's a difference in pollinators that have now become into that valley or what have you. So there's something that's driven that change. However, sympatric speciation means that both of these populations are occurring together and are still differentiated from each other. That's usually something that's going to be kicked off by either reproductive barrier, barriers or temporal barriers, some sort of thing that's going to keep them from reproducing when they can't. So more specifically, allopatric speciation reflects a geographical barrier. Things like mountains, rivers, glaciers, any other structures that can physically separate a population into two groups, but then cannot interbreed. Now, as a result of this barrier, there's no gene transfer between these two populations. Their allele frequencies become more and more distinct. And over time, they ultimately can't be produced. Probably the best example of this are ions. 
For example, the Galapagos tortoise has a bunch of different populations spread out between about seven or eight different islands that are all separated by water that have subsequently diverged into new subspecies based off of what island they're on. Now, basically what happened is at one point, at least all of these islands were relatively connected. I believe it had something to do with the sea level rise or something like that. And so as sea level rise increased, it increased the amount of water level. And as a result, it split off these islands from each other. And because you know you have other changes going on where you know maybe certain plants become more populous in certain islands, that sort of thing. As a result, you get uh, phenotypic differences in these organisms. For instance, uh, this hood island tortoise with that more saddleback shell. The reason for that is it allows the nets to reach up higher into plants and scrub. Whereas this more classic look from Santa Cruz island tortoise with that dome shell, that's going to be there more from like ground dwelling plants. They're going to be picking off those sorts of things. Additionally, you can have situations like these isolated springs that can lead to allopatric speciation. So here you have a couple of very isolated pockets of water that are spread throughout the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, specifically, you have these pupfish that this one is specifically from uh, Devil's Hole in Nevada, which have become isolated in this hot spring long ago. And now their gene pool has shifted enough that they can no longer mate with fish from nearby springs. In other words, at some point, these fish somehow showed up in these very isolated springs, whether that be through accident or just getting lucky. Um, and as a result, because there's now been five to 10 million years of just random microevolution, they're totally different and can't reproduce anymore. Um, this is actually really fascinating because uh, and this is something you can observe in Florida, especially, where you have all these little isolated little wetlands that will show up for like 50% of the year and then disappear and go completely dry. How in the hell do the fish get there, right? Basically, what happens is you can have situations where certain fish have developed their eggs so they can pass through bird digestive systems. So the bird will come up, eat a pregnant female, and it will deposit eggs in some of these wetlands. And so that's how you usually see those little tiny mosquito fish everywhere. That's usually through that mechanism. That's probably what manifests something like this, too. Now, like you mentioned, sympatric speciation occurs when they share the same habitat, but they're still differentiating. Now, some populations diverge genetically even when they are living together. And all the habitat may appear uniform, often it consists of many little different microenvironments that can select for different phenotypes based off of often very small changes. Um, particularly in Florida, this is very noticeable because if you just go driving around central Florida, or it's really probably the best way to, uh, to see this is in the Everglades. A difference of three inches in elevation causes entirely different plant communities. And even though they're all still connected, they're all still close to each other. You may have species that hyper focus on the more upland habitat that has a lot more plant or a lot more tree life, a lot more that kind of thing, versus plants that, or animals that might focus on more grassy open areas. And as a result, even though they're occupying the same general area, they're still divergent. And again, these microenvironments can really lead to that sympatric speciation. Uh, another great example of this is the uh, deep lakes that usually occur in the African Rift Valley, which is where you get a lot of the really colorful tropical fish for like uh, private aquariums, particularly those African cichlids that you often see kind of just lumped together as a single species, where you can have bright yellows, reds, blues, what have you. Well, a lot of what shapes them separating into different species is how far deep in this water body they go, because the deeper that they go, and reproduce at different levels, it can cause that perception of color to change in the eyes of the female fish. So as a result, if she's targeting for a bright red female, what a bright red, or sorry, what a bright red male looks like at the top of the water is gonna look totally different than the bottom of the um, water column, just based off of the light diffusion and things like that. So that's what might be driving some of that too. And finally, you get something called polyploid, which can lead to sympathetic speciation as well which is a situation where you have non-disjunction and it results in additional chromosomes being added. So probably the best example of this here in the Southeast is the gray tree frog versus cope straight gray tree frog. The regular gray tree frog just has your typical diploid cells 
whereas Cope's gray is a tetraport. It has two additional copies of everything. And usually the way this works the best is if you have like an even number of chromosomes, because then your body can kind of like select from things a little bit easier and it's not fighting between which of these three it needs to pull. It just for whatever reason, that inactivation works better with four versus two. And what's really cool is you can have entire speciation events, like I've mentioned earlier with these unisexual salamanders where it's a trisexual or a diploid or a uniploid organism, or a triploid, diploid, or uh, uniploid, it just kind of depends. And they will reproductively mate with males of another species, take whatever genetic material they want, get rid of the rest, and kind of go on their merry way and kind of reproduce that way. It's really fascinating. However, probably the most common examples of a lot of these are in plants. For whatever reason, plants have incredible genomes that can handle sometimes upwards of 16 different chromosomes for a single like set of chromosomes, which is ridiculous. The determining the type of speciation is going to be probably very difficult. And it kind of depends on you being omnipresent, knowing every single little condition that happened in the environment. And as a result, the scientists were trying to piece apart what is the most likely cause for the speciation event. We have to take a lot of things into account and kind of use them to see, okay, maybe it's like 50% allopatric speciation, but another 40% reproductive barriers, that sort of thing. Another thing to keep in mind too, is that the reproductive, uh, these barriers are not the same for every single species. So a bird that can fly hundreds of miles, its reproductive barriers are gonna be vastly different than a frog that can only hop a mile itself in a day. And as a result, you often see species that, particularly in birds, can range the entirety of the Alaskan um, South Pole, or sorry, the Antarctic South Pole, all the way up to Alaska. And it just kind of depends on what time of year they may be occupying those specific areas, or if they might have resident populations, even though they're not necessarily different species. So let's do this review question here. So about 3 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama closed, forming the land bridge that connects South America and North America. Now, snapping shrimp collected from water on one side of the Isthmus look very similar to those on the other, but they cannot interbreed. What happened? Is it sympathetic speciation? Huh. Can it be both types of speciation? Probably not. So in this case, it's simply just allopatric speciation. Now, the speciation can occur at different paces of time. So evidence from fossil records support kind of two different models of speciation. You have gradualism, which is where you have these slow accumulation of species over time, or something called a punctuated equilibrium, where you may go from one species to three or four species very, very quickly. And this is usually kind of dependent on the environmental conditions, and arguably they're probably both right. Now, again, this gradualism is slow and steady, and it's Evidence from the fossil record shows that these microscopic ocean protists have evolved in small, slow, incremental changes. However, you also have this punctuated equilibrium, which is a short, irregular burst of speciation, which is where many different species show periods of rapid evolution followed by a period of stability. And again, this is oftentimes uh, documented at the beginning of a, usually like a new major group arriving on the scene. So for instance, when dinosaurs first showed up in the Triassic period, you could argue that was a punctuated equilibrium because they went from a very basic coelophysis body plan to less than 30 million years later having you know, some of the largest organisms on Earth. And all that stuff is just based off of this rapid punctuated evolution. And so one of the things to keep in mind to kind of differentiate in between the two is what do you define as a short versus a long period of time? And it can be very, very different depending on who you're talking to, whether it's a fossil biologist or somebody, a paleontologist or somebody that's actively studying evolution right now. Now these punctuated equilibriums is often reflected in allopatric speciation where these geographical features can change rapidly. Doesn't seem like much, but you know, even the context of 10,000 years between now and when humans, or when you lost a lot of the ice age micro or macrofauna, the, the biology of Florida and how everything was shaped is completely different. And thus these bursts of evolution would follow these upheavals 
such as a volcano or a flood, the formation of new rivers, the formation of new mountains, whatever. And while long periods of evolutionary stability would take place in between. Now, speciation often occurs after mass extinction. For instance, um, after the KT event that caused the asteroid that wiped out about 70% of life on Earth, you now have 70% you know, of life's niches that are completely unoccupied. So animals that may have been smaller or different are going to try to reach out and fill those niches that are now being unoccupied. So for instance, that's why you often see mammals now that have very similar life histories to things like dinosaurs, because at some point, they have very similar ecological or environmental conditions acting on them. Now, ultimately, extinction marks the end of the line. So for um, probably, I don't know why they're trying to say there. So ultimately what happens is at some point extinction hits um, and it can occur for a wide variety of different reasons. In fact, we have, I think, six documented mass extinction events. Five of them occurred before humans, one of them is occurring now. And it's all kind of based off of what species were present, what era was it, that sort of thing. Now, like I mentioned, you can have these short, small losses of a single species here or there, or you can have mass extinctions, which is where you lose a lot of them all at once. Now, the fossil records show evidence for at least five um, in the last 600 million years due to major environmental changes. Probably, I think the most classic one that everybody knows about is the KT event that occurred at the end of the Cretaceous period that wiped out about 70% of all life on Earth. However, it's still not the worst. Something called the Great Dying that occurred at the end of the Permian was a lot more influential and knocked out almost 95%. And as a result, all the like amphibian lineages that we used to have are now down to just frogs and salamanders. But at one point, amphibians were the dominant form of life on Earth. And like I mentioned, these catastrophic events can explain some of these mass extinctions. For instance, you have the impact theory that explains that meteorites or comets have caused dinosaurs to become extinct in the Cretaceous period. Pretty definitive, that's what we know what happened. Basically, when the KT event happened and that meteor or the asteroid struck the US or struck the Gulf of Mexico, it changed the environmental conditions through the uh, adding of additional ash up into the atmosphere and a bunch of other things that caused a basically massive decrease in the global temperatures, going somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 degrees lower. Basically, what people would describe as a nuclear winter that people often kind of refer to, like if everybody launched all your nuclear weapons, that similar kind of process happened just with an asteroid instead. And unfortunately, like I mentioned a couple of times now, we're currently in the sixth mass extinction, which is happening to a, a wide variety of different mechanisms. But unfortunately, and probably most interestingly, this is the first time a single species by itself has caused this, to our knowledge. Now humans have profoundly altered the environment through causing things like massive habitat loss or fragmentation. For instance, it's pretty damn noticeable when you've been out walking in the Arboretum and you come back on campus. The Arboretum is, in theory, what Florida would have looked like 400 to 500 years ago. And now you see this, and for context, UCF in particular has grown at an exorbitant rate. At one point where Libra field or Libra garages and a bunch of others, basically anything beyond that extra ring that's Gemini, that was all just forests. And it's now almost completely lost except for the area that they've designated as a reserve. And that's happening across central Florida massively. And ironically, Florida is doing the best out of a lot of states, particularly in the Southeast, because there's a lot of push from both Democratic and Republican governors to actually save a lot of this area. Um, Governor Jeb Bush was actually really implement, uh, crucial in implementing that back in the early 2000s. So another thing that could explain a lot of these massive extinctions are things like plate tectonics. So over time, these shifting land masses have caused dra dramatic effects on life, particularly on the quantity and the presence of particular land masses, as well as where water occurs on the earth. So obviously, if you're one giant continent, you're not going to have as many, you know, access to sea or anything like that, and it might kind of separate different things. Whereas nowadays, you might have a lot of different species that are derived independently in the Atlantic versus the Pacific Ocean because they're so separated. 
Now, ultimately, what we've kind of mentioned here is that biological classification systems are based on something called common descent. You start with a basic ancestor, then it breaks down into your grandparents, your parents, your, yourselves, all that sort of thing. And ultimately, that reflects the evolutionary history of things. So in order to keep track of all this, we deal with something called taxonomy, which is a science of describing and naming as well as classifying an organism. So the most inclusive taxon is usually the domain, but the least inclusive being the species. So it usually goes domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Like King Philip died while drinking chocolate. Er, nope, that's planet. Um, it's something about King Philip for whatever reason. Um, but honestly, it's probably easier just to memorize it. Now, taxonomy organizes species into these groups. So, for instance, modern taxonomy is often based off of the work of Linnaeus, like we mentioned earlier, and it uses uh, anatomy as well as genetic techniques, as well as these reproductive barriers that we've been talking about, to kind of factor in what should be different from another. So, ultimately, the more features two organisms have in common, the more taxonomic levels they can share. For instance, a chimpanzee and orangutan are going to be a lot more closely related. I believe they're in the same family. Um, but they're not the same genus and they're not the same species. Whereas something like the fly or the octopus, they're going to share the same domain because they're still both animals, right? But they're not anywhere close to the, the sharing that same level of uh, relationship that those two, other two do. And then this ultimately breaks down into something called cladistics, which is based off of the shared derived traits. So in other words, the distinct distinguishes between traits that are ancestral, inherited, or traits that are derived, not inherited from the ancestor. And we use that to basically help classify these things into clades or taxon or however you want to put it. It gets kind of confusing rather quickly. I'm not going to go super in depth with it. Um, for instance, here you have very strong specific relationships where at some point there was an ancestral character for the mammals that divided up everything else into different things. So, for instance, you had a basic ancestral mammal that probably existed sometime at the end of the late Cretaceous. Then you had mammals that developed these glands in the hair, well, mammal glands in the hair, and that included all the ones that we currently have. Ultimately, they differentiated into where mammals no longer needed their eggs and they could give birth to life young. That's when you give rise to the marsupials and the placenta mammals. And finally, the development of the placenta, which is there to nourish. Uh, the offspring and allow it to not have to only be in your uh, uterus for like six weeks is developed and it gives that long term uh, uh, nutrient supplementary uh, approach, which allows them to develop and have a lot more ability to survive on their own rather quickly. Now, cladograms are these diagrams that I'm showing you that are the, showing these evolutionary relationships. This is a really valuable tool that's used to kind of develop these hypotheses about the relationships between different organisms. And these clades are, you know, a specific group of birds, not even dinosaurs, crocodiles, that sort of thing. And here's just all the ones from basically the development of tetrapods, which is a huge four-limbed organism, all the way down to where birds are, where crocodiles, mammals, turtles, whatever. And something you'll see really quickly is herpetology, right, which is a study of all reptiles. It's missing mammals and it's missing birds. For whatever reason, just because we view them as different for a long time, we didn't lump them in with what we consider to be a reptile, right? And so that's why oftentimes you can see these differentiations between a cladogram and the actual taxonomy behind some things sometimes. Again, these cladograms consist of clades, which are simply a group of organisms consisting of a common ancestor and all its descendants. So for instance, birds, dinosaurs, and crocodiles all have a common ancestor, which makes them a single clade together. Whereas you can talk about just birds by themselves as well as a clade too. Now these physical similarities between these organisms can result from convergent evolution. Um, these are not the focus of cladistics. So in other words, if you have two organisms that live in very similar environments, say for instance, a, uh, um, something like a crocodile and early whales that look almost identical to each other. Um, 
it's just because that they're evolved to fit a particular niche, and that's not with a six. That's just convergent evolution happening. Now, these common ancestors indicate their evolutionary relatedness. So, obviously, birds and dinosaurs share a more common ancestor, which makes them a clade. They're more closely related to each other than they are to crocodilians as a result. But still, birds, dinosaurs, and crocodiles have an older common ancestor, which makes them still a larger clade together. And again, like I like to point out, reptiles don't form a clade. The Linnaean class reptilia, which includes turtles, lizards, snakes, and crocodiles, and the extinct dinosaurs, but it excludes birds. But birds are in the same clade with reptiles sharing um, many of the same derived characteristics. So from a cladistics perspective, they're, they're included, but from a non cladistics perspective, they're not. And thus, it kind of gets a little hairy in how people kind of, there's a lot of this weird like leftover uh, history that kind of shapes how we view particular fields, whether it be herpetologists versus a ornithologist who studies birds, a mammologist who obviously studies mammals, that sort of thing. Now, what's kind of interesting is you can also map other things to it and kind of just decide if certain traits are more representative of uh, convergent evolution or if they're just representative of an actual cladistic evolutionary relationship. So here, for instance, you have endothermy, which is basically where you're using your own metabolism to keep your body warm. So obviously, birds and mammals are both endotherms, and some turtles are too, uh, and they're able to maintain that internal constant body temperature. However, their last common ancestors couldn't have been endothermic because you have all these exothermic conditions that are in between. Does that make sense? All right. So here's a quick review question that'll help kind of narrow this stuff down a little bit. Why are dinosaurs more closely related to birds than to crocodiles and lizards? A, uh, birds and dinosaurs both walk on two legs, whereas crocodiles and lizards do not. B, trick question, they aren't. C, dinosaurs and birds share the most recent common ancestor. And finally, D, dinosaurs are extinct and so, many, or, and so are many birds. Let's kind of talk through this real quick. Obviously, B is stupid. Um, what about A? Why is it wrong? What would this be an example of? We just kind of talked about it. It starts with the C. Convergent evolution, right? They're filling a niche. It's not because it's an evolutionary derived trait. What about B here? Dinosaurs extinct and so are many birds. That's just stupid, right? It has nothing to do with anything. Um, being extinct isn't really a trait. It's just kind of what happens to you. And finally, so obviously, clearly the answer is that C, birds, and dinosaurs share the most recent common ancestors like we've been talking. So let's look at another one. So using the cladogram below, is Protista a clade with all protists? The answer is either yes, because they share a common ancestor, or no, because not all descendants from the common ancestor are included in the group. C. What groups are included in Protista from an evolutionary perspective that we don't usually account for? Think about it. So let's let's take a step back to what's interesting. Protists are just these simple eukaryotic organisms, right? They're often unicellular, but they can often differentiate quite a bit where you have things like algae, which are plant-like protists. You have more fungal-like protists called uh, mycetozoans, And then you have more animal-like protists. Obviously, this means it's probably because they're basal forms to what might have become an animal, what might have become a plant, or what might have become a fungus at some point, based off of evolutionary relationships. So in this case, we can probably go ahead and rule out A, because from a, this, while this is a cladogram, it's showing us very broad specific clade of protists altogether, we often don't usually include animals, plants, and fungi. We often separate them out because from a anatomical perspective, from a genetic perspective, they're so different than everything else in protists. So in this case, the correct answer would be B, no, because not all the descendants are the common ancestor are included in this group. So let's take a second to look at some cool examples. So an extrafloral nectary is a plant structure that has arisen independently over a hundred times in different plant evolution. In other words, it's convergent, right? It's showing up in different lineages all on their own. Now ants and wasps are attracted to the sugary nectar 
And so attracting them helps to protect plants from herbivores. Specifically, uh, things like the umbrella thorn acacia and uh, the eastern part of Africa, particularly Tanzania, Tanzania, that sort of thing. They have developed these very specialized nectaries that house ants. So that way, when they're being eaten by a giraffe or something like that, they send chemical signals to these nectaries. And as a result, the ants swarm the giraffe and try to bite the crap out of them so they leave the plant alone. Now, ultimately, these protection rackets are going to increase speciation. And the reason for this is because one, you have all these different nectaries that are showing up, right? And different kinds of plants and in different places. And as a result, you're not always going to get the same species of ants or the same species of wasps that's going to use that nectar. And over time, what you're going to see is that you're going to have a bunch of different plants that all have these different things. And as a result, each one probably has its own specific ant species or wasp species that colonizes that particular nectary and is helpful in the defense of that particular plant. It's really kind of cool. Ultimately, plants with extra floral nectaries showed higher rates of speciation compared to plants without them, suggesting that the role of evolution in many new plant species is being coming through this whole field. Because as a result of them being protected by these very specific situations, you may have natural selection acting on the shape of that nectary and all that sort of stuff, which ultimately leads into microevolution itself and ultimately macroevolution. All right. Don't forget about quiz two due at the end of the week. Uh, exam three is coming up next Friday. So keep that in mind. And don't forget biology on Monday, extra credit next Friday. And um, the uh, last day for drop ad is I believe, Friday, the 29th. All right.